Please subscribe my channel. First Love Chapter 1 I was 16 then. It happened in the summer of 1833. I lived in Moscow with my parents. They had taken a country house for the summer near the Kaluga Gate, facing the Neskochny Gardens. I was preparing for the university, but did not work much and was in no hurry. No one interfered with my freedom. I did what I liked, especially after parting with my last tutor, a Frenchman who had never been able to get used to the idea that he had fallen like a bomb, commune bomb, into Russia and would lie sluggishly in bed with an expression of exasperation on his face for days together. My father treated me with careless kindness, my mother scarcely noticed me, though she had no children except me. Other cares completely absorbed her. My father, a man still young and very handsome, had married her from mercenary considerations. She was ten years older than he. My mother led a melancholy life. She was forever agitated, jealous and angry, but not in my father's presence. She was very much afraid of him, and he was severe, cold, and distant in his behavior. I have never seen a man more elaborately serene, self-confident, and commanding. I shall never forget the first weeks I spent at the country house. The weather was magnificent. We left town on the 9th of May, on St. Nicholas's Day. I used to walk about in our garden, in the Neskochny Gardens. And beyond the town gates, I would take some book with me, Kaidanov's course, for instance, but I rarely looked into it, and more often than anything declaimed verses aloud, I knew a great deal of poetry by heart. My blood was in a ferment and my heart ached, so sweetly and absurdly, I was all hope and anticipation, was a little frightened of something, and full of wonder at everything, and was on the tiptoe of expectation. My imagination played continually, fluttering rapidly about the same fancies, like Martin's about a bell tower at dawn. I dreamed, was sad, even wept, but through the tears and through the sadness. Inspired by a musical verse, or the beauty of evening, shot up like grass in spring the delicious sense of youth and effervescent life. I had a horse to ride, I used to saddle it myself and set off alone for long rides, break into a rapid gallop and fancy myself a knight at a tournament. How gaily the wind whistled in my ears! or turning my face towards the sky, I would absorb its shining radiance and blew into my soul. That opened wide to welcome it. Dot I remember that at that time the image of woman, the vision of love, scarcely ever arose in definite shape in my brain, but in all I thought, in all I felt, lay hidden a half-conscious, shame-faced presentiment of something new, unutterably sweet, feminine. This presentiment, this expectation, permeated my whole being, I breathed in it. It coursed through my veins with every drop of blood, it was destined to be soon fulfilled. The place, where we settled for the summer, consisted of a wooden manor house with columns and two small lodges. In the lodge on the left there was a tiny factory for the manufacture of cheap wallpapers. I had more than once strolled that way to look at about a dozen thin and disheveled boys with greasy smocks and worn faces, 
who were perpetually jumping on to wooden levers that pressed down the square blocks of the press, and so by the weight of their feeble bodies struck off the variegated patterns of the wallpapers. The lodge on the right stood empty and was to let. One day, three weeks after, the ninth of May, the blinds in the windows of this lodge were drawn up, women's faces appeared at them, some family had installed themselves in it. I remember the same day at dinner. My mother inquired of the butler who were our new neighbors, and hearing the name of the Princess Zosiakin, first observed with some respect, ah, a princess, and then added, a poor one, I suppose. They arrived in three hired flies, the butler remarked deferentially, as he handed a dish, they don't keep their own carriage, and the furniture's of the poorest. Ah, replied my mother, so much the better. My father gave her a chilly glance. She was silent. Certainly the Princess Zosiakin could not be a rich woman. The lodge she had taken was so dilapidated and small and low-pitched that people, even moderately well-off in the world, would hardly have consented to occupy it. At the time, however, all this went in at one ear and out at the other. The princely title had very little effect on me. I had just been reading Schiller's Robbers. Chapter 2 I was in the habit of wandering about our garden every evening on the lookout for rooks. I had long cherished a hatred for those wary, sly, and rapacious birds. On the day of which I have been speaking, I went as usual into the garden, and after patrolling all the walks without success, the rooks knew me, and merely cawed spasmodically at a distance, I chanced to go close to the low fence which separated our domain from the narrow strip of garden stretching beyond the lodge to the right and belonging to it. I was walking along, my eyes on the ground. Suddenly I heard a voice, I looked across the fence, and was thunderstruck. I was confronted with a curious spectacle dot a few paces from me on the grass between the green raspberry bushes. Stood a tall slender girl in a striped pink dress with a white kerchief on her head, for young men were close round her, and she was slapping them by turns on the forehead with those small grey flowers, the name of which I don't know, though they are well known to children, the flowers form little bags and burst open with a pop when you strike them against anything hard. The young men presented their foreheads so eagerly and in the gestures of the girl, I saw her in profile, there was something so fascinating, imperious, caressing, mocking, and charming, that I almost cried out with admiration and delight, and would, I thought, have given everything in the world on the spot only to have had those exquisite fingers strike me on the forehead. My gun slipped on to the grass, I forgot everything. I devoured with my eyes the graceful shape and neck and lovely arms and the slightly disordered fair hair under the white kerchief, and the half-closed clever eye and the eyelashes and the soft cheek beneath them. Young man, hey, young man, said a voice suddenly near me, is it quite permissible to stare so at unknown young ladies? I started, I was struck dumb. Near me, the other side of the fence, stood a man with close-cropped black hair, looking ironically at me. 
At the same instant the girl too turned towards me. I caught sight of big grey eyes in a bright mobile face, and the whole face suddenly quivered and laughed. There was a flash of white teeth, a droll lifting of the eyebrows. I crimsoned, picked up my gun from the ground, and pursued by a musical but not ill-natured laugh, fled to my own room, flung myself on the bed, and hid my face in my hands. My heart was fairly leaping, I was greatly ashamed and overjoyed. I felt an excitement I had never known before. After a rest, I brushed my hair, washed, and went downstairs to tea. The image of the young girl floated before me, my heart was no longer leaping, but was full of a sort of sweet oppression. What's the matter? My father asked me all at once, have you killed a rook? I was on the point of telling him all about it, but I checked myself and merely smiled to myself. As I was going to bed, I rotated, I don't know why, three times on one leg, pomaded my hair, got into bed, and slept like a top all night. Before morning I woke up for an instant, raised my head, looked round me in ecstasy, and fell asleep again. Chapter 3 How can I make their acquaintance, was my first thought when I waked in the morning. I went out in the garden before morning tea, but I did not go too near the fence, and saw no one. After drinking tea, I walked several times up and down the street before the house, and looked into the windows from a distance. I fancied her face at a curtain, and I hurried away in alarm. I must make her acquaintance, though, I thought, pacing distractedly about the sandy plain that stretches before Neskuchny Park. But how, that is the question. I recalled the minutest details of our meeting yesterday. I had for some reason or other a particularly vivid recollection of how she had laughed at me. But while I racked my brains and made various plans, fate had already provided for me. In my absence my mother had received from her new neighbor a letter on gray paper, sealed with brown wax, such as is only used in notices from the post office or on the corks of bottles of cheap wine. In this letter, which was written in illiterate language and in a slovenly hand, the princess begged my mother to use her powerful influence in her behalf, my mother, in the words of the princess, was very intimate with persons of high position upon whom her fortunes and her children's fortunes depended, as she had some very important business in hand. I address myself to you, she wrote, as one gentlewoman to another gentlewoman, and for that reason am glad to avail myself of the opportunity. Concluding, she begged my mother's permission to call upon her. I found my mother in an unpleasant state of indecision, my father was not at home, and she had no one of whom to ask advice. Not to answer a gentlewoman and a princess into the bargain was impossible. But my mother was in a difficulty as to how to answer her. To write a note in French struck her as unsuitable, and Russian spelling was not a strong point with my mother herself, and she was aware of it, and did not care to expose herself. She was overjoyed when I made my appearance, and at once told me to go round to the princesses, 
and to explain to her by word of mouth that my mother would always be glad to do Her Excellency any service within her powers, and begged her to come to see her at one o'clock. This unexpectedly rapid fulfillment of my secret desires both delighted and appalled me. I made no sign, however, of the perturbation which came over me and as a preliminary step went to my own room to put on a new necktie and tail-coat. At home I still wore short jackets and lay-down collars, much as I abominated them. Chapter 4 In the narrow and untidy passage of the lodge, which I entered with an involuntary tremor in all my limbs, I was met by an old grey-headed servant with a dark copper-coloured face, surly little pig's eyes, and such deep furrows on his forehead and temples as I had never beheld in my life. He was carrying a plate containing the spine of a herring that had been gnawed at, and shutting the door that led into the room with his foot, he jerked out, What do you want? Is the Princess Zosiakin at home? I inquired, Vonifidi, a jarring female voice screamed from within. The man without a word turned his back on me, exhibiting as he did so the extremely threadbare hind part of his livery with a solitary reddish heraldic button on it. He put the plate down on the floor and went away. Did you go to the police station? The same female voice called again. The man muttered something in reply. Eh? Has someone come? I heard again. The young gentleman from next door. Ask him in, then, will you step into the drawing room, said the servant, making his appearance once more and picking up the plate from the floor. I mastered my emotions, and went into the drawing-room. I found myself in a small and not over-clean apartment, containing some poor furniture that looked as if it had been hurriedly set down where it stood. At the window in an easy chair with a broken arm was sitting a woman of fifty, bareheaded and ugly, in an old green dress, and a striped worsted wrap about her neck. Her small black eyes fixed me like pins. I went up to her and bowed. I have the honor of addressing the Princess Zosiakin. I am the Princess Zosiakin, and you are the son of Mr. V. Yes. I have come to you with a message from my mother. Sit down, please. Vonifati, where are my keys? Have you seen them? I communicated to Madame Zosiakin my mother's reply to her note. She heard me out, drumming with her fat red fingers on the window pane, and when I had finished, she stared at me once more. Very good, I'll be sure to come, she observed at last. But how young you are! How old are you, may I ask? Sixteen, I replied, with an involuntary stammer. The princess drew out of her pocket some greasy papers covered with writing, raised them right up to her nose, and began looking through them. A good age, she ejaculated suddenly, turning round restlessly on her chair. And do you, pray, make yourself at home? I don't stand on ceremony. No, indeed, I thought, scanning her unprepossessing person with a disgust I could not restrain. At that instant another door flew open quickly, and in the doorway stood the girl I had seen the previous evening in the garden. She lifted her hand, 
and a mocking smile gleamed in her face. Here is my daughter, observed the princess, indicating her with her elbow. Zinochka, the son of our neighbor, Mr. V. What is your name, allow me to ask? Vladimir, I answered, getting up and stuttering in my excitement, and your father's name? Petrovich, ah. I used to know a commissioner of police whose name was Vladimir Petrovich, too. Vonifati. Don't look for my keys, the keys are in my pocket. The young girl was still looking at me with the same smile, faintly fluttering her eyelids and putting her head a little on one side. I have seen Monsieur Voldemar before, she began. The silvery note of her voice ran through me with a sort of sweet shiver. You will let me call you so? Oh, please, I faltered. Where was that? asked the princess. The young princess did not answer her mother. Have you anything to do just now? she said, not taking her eyes off me. Oh, no. Would you like to help me win some wool? Come in here, to me. She nodded to me and went out of the drawing room. I followed her. In the room we went into, the furniture was a little better and was arranged with more taste. Though, indeed, at the moment, I was scarcely capable of noticing anything. I moved as in a dream and felt all through my being a sort of intense blissfulness that verged on imbecility. The young princess sat down, took out a skein of red wool and, motioning me to a seat opposite her, carefully untied the skein and laid it across my hands. All this she did in silence with a sort of droll deliberation and with the same bright sly smile on her slightly parted lips. She began to wind the wool on a bent card, and all at once she dazzled me with a glance so brilliant and rapid that I could not help dropping my eyes. When her eyes, which were generally half-closed, opened to their full extent, her face was completely transfigured, it was as though it were flooded with light. What did you think of me yesterday? Msu Voldemar, she asked after a brief pause. You thought ill of me, I expect? I, princess. I thought nothing, how can I? I answered in confusion, listen, she rejoined. You don't know me yet. I'm a very strange person, I like always to be told the truth. You, I have just heard, are sixteen, and I am twenty-one, you see I'm a great deal older than you, and so you ought always to tell me the truth, and to do what I tell you, she added. Look at me. Why don't you look at me? I was still more abashed, however, I raised my eyes to her. She smiled, not her former smile, but a smile of approbation. Look at me, she said, dropping her voice caressingly. I don't dislike that. I like your face. I have a presentiment we shall be friends. But do you like me, she added slyly, princess. I was beginning. In the first place, you must call me Zinada Alexandrovna and in the second place it's a bad habit for children. She corrected herself, for young people, not to say straight out what they feel. That's all very well for grown-up people. You like me, don't you? Though I was greatly delighted that she talked so freely to me, still I was a little hurt. I wanted to show her that she had not a mere boy to deal with. 
and assuming as easy and serious an air as I could, I observed, certainly. I like you very much, Zinad Alexandrovna, I have no wish to conceal it, she shook her head very deliberately. Have you a tutor? she asked suddenly. No, I've not had a tutor for a long, long while, I told a lie, it was not a month since I had parted with my Frenchman, oh. I see then, you are quite grown up. She tapped me lightly on the fingers. Hold your hands straight. And she applied herself busily to winding the ball. I seized the opportunity when she was looking down and fell to watching her, at first stealthily, then more and more boldly. Her face struck me as even more charming than on the previous evening, everything in it was so delicate, clever, and sweet. She was sitting with her back to a window covered with a white blind, the sunshine, streaming in through the blind, shed a soft light over her fluffy golden curls, her innocent neck, her sloping shoulders, and tender untroubled bosom. I gazed at her, and how dear and near she was already to me. It seemed to me I had known her a long while and had never known anything nor lived at all till I met her. She was wearing a dark and rather shabby dress and an apron I would gladly, I felt, have kissed every fold of that dress and apron. The tips of her little shoes peeped out from under her skirt, I could have bowed down in adoration to those shoes. And here I am sitting before her, I thought, I have made acquaintance with her, what happiness, my God! I could hardly keep from jumping up from my chair in ecstasy, but I only swung my legs a little. Like a small child who has been given sweetmeats, dot I was as happy as a fish in water, and I could have stayed in that room forever, have never left that place her eyelids were slowly lifted, and once more her clear eyes shone kindly upon me. And again she smiled, how you look at me, she said slowly, and she held up a threatening finger. I blushed. She understands it all, she sees all, flashed through my mind. And how could she fail to understand and see it all? All at once there was a sound in the next room, the clink of a saber, Zina, screamed the princess in the drawing-room. Bialovzorov has brought you a kitten. A kitten, cried Zinaida, and getting up from her chair impetuously, she flung the ball of worsted on my knees and ran away. I too got up and, laying the skein and the ball of wool on the window sill, I went into the drawing-room and stood still, hesitating. In the middle of the room, a tabby kitten was lying with outstretched paws. Zenaida was on her knees before it, cautiously lifting up its little face. Near the old princess, and filling up almost the whole space between the two windows, was a flaxen curly-headed young man, a hussar, with a rosy face and prominent eyes. What a funny little thing! Zenaida was saying, and its eyes are not grey, but green, and what long ears! Thank you, Viktor Yegorich. You are very kind. The hussar, in whom I recognized one of the young men I had seen the evening before, smiled and bowed with a clink of his spurs and a jingle of the chain of his saber. You were pleased to say yesterday that you wished to possess a tabby kitten with long ears, so I obtained it. Your word is law. 
and he bowed again, the kitten gave a feeble mew and began sniffing the ground. It's hungry, cried Zenaida. Vonifidi, Sonia. Bring some milk, a maid, in an old yellow gown with a faded kerchief at her neck, came in with a saucer of milk and set it before the kitten. The kitten started, blinked, and began lapping. What a pink little tongue it has, remarked Zenaida, putting her head almost on the ground and peeping at it sideways under its very nose. The kitten, having had enough, began to purr and move its paws affectedly. Zenaida got up, and turning to the maid said carelessly, Take it away, for the kitten, your little hand, said the hussar, with a simper and a shrug of his strongly built frame, which was tightly buttoned up in a new uniform. Both, replied Zenaida, and she held out her hands to him. While he was kissing them, she looked at me over his shoulder. I stood stock still in the same place and did not know whether to laugh, to say something, or to be silent. Suddenly through the open door into the passage I caught sight of our footman, Fyodor. He was making signs to me. Mechanically I went out to him, What do you want? I asked. Your mama has sent for you, he said in a whisper. She is angry that you have not come back with the answer, Why, have I been here long? Over an hour. Over an hour. I repeated unconsciously, and going back to the drawing-room I began to make bows and scrape with my heels, Where are you off to? The young princess asked, glancing at me from behind the hussar. I must go home. So I am to say, I added, addressing the old lady, that you will come to us about two, do you say so, my good sir? The princess hurriedly pulled out her snuff-box and took snuff so loudly that I positively jumped. Do you say so, she repeated, blinking tearfully and sneezing. I bowed once more, turned, and went out of the room with that sensation of awkwardness in my spine which a very young man feels, when he knows he is being looked at from behind. Mind you come and see us again, Mr. Voldemar, Zenaida called, and she laughed again, why is it she's always laughing? I thought, as I went back home escorted by Fyodor, who said nothing to me, but walked behind me with an air of disapprobation. My mother scolded me and wondered whatever I could have been doing so long at the princess's. I made her no reply and went off to my own room. I felt suddenly very sad. I tried hard not to cry. I was jealous of the hussar. Chapter 5 The princess called on my mother as she had promised and made a disagreeable impression on her. I was not present at their interview, but at table my mother told my father that this Prince Sosiakin struck her as a femme tres vulgaire, that she had quite worn her out begging her to interest Prince Sergei in their behalf, that she seemed to have no end of lawsuits and affairs on hand, de Villain's affairs d'argent, and must be a very troublesome and litigious person. My mother added, however, that she had asked her and her daughter to dinner the next day, hearing the word daughter. I buried my nose in my plate, for after all she was a neighbor and a person of title. Upon this my father informed my mother that he remembered now who this lady was, 
that he had in his youth known the deceased Prince Sasayakin, a very well-bred but frivolous and absurd person, that he had been nicknamed in society Le Parisian, from having lived a long while in Paris, that he had been very rich, but had gambled away all his property, and for some unknown reason, probably for money, though indeed he might have chosen better. If so, my father added with a cold smile, he had married the daughter of an agent, and after his marriage had entered upon speculations and ruined himself utterly. If only she doesn't try to borrow money, observed my mother. That's exceedingly possible, my father responded tranquilly. Does she speak French? Very badly. Hum. It's of no consequence anyway. I think you said you had asked the daughter too. Someone was telling me she was a very charming and cultivated girl. Ah. Then she can't take after her mother, nor her father either, rejoined my father. He was cultivated indeed, but a fool. My mother sighed and sank into thought. My father said no more. I felt very uncomfortable during this conversation. After dinner I went into the garden, but without my gun. I swore to myself that I would not go near the Zosiakin's garden, but an irresistible force drew me thither, and not in vain. I had hardly reached the fence when I caught sight of Zenaida. This time she was alone. She held a book in her hands, and was coming slowly along the path. She did not notice me. I almost let her pass by, but all at once I changed my mind and coughed. She turned round, but did not stop, pushed back with one hand the broad blue ribbon of her round straw hat, looked at me, smiled slowly, and again bent her eyes on the book. I took off my cap, and after hesitating a moment, walked away with a heavy heart. Quais was J.E. poor L? I thought, God knows why, in French. Familiar footsteps sounded behind me. I looked round. My father came up to me with his light. Rapid walk. I s that the young princess. He asked me, yes, why, do you know her? I saw her this morning at the princess's. My father stopped and, turning sharply on his heel, went back. When he was on a level with Zenaida, he made her a courteous bow. She, too, bowed to him with some astonishment on her face and dropped her book. I saw how she looked after him. My father was always irreproachably dressed, simple and in a style of his own but his figure had never struck me as more graceful, never had his grey hat sat more becomingly on his curls, which were scarcely perceptibly thinner than they had once been. I bent my steps toward Zenaida, but she did not even glance at me, she picked up her book again and went away. Chapter 6 the whole evening and the following day I spent in a sort of dejected apathy. I remember I tried to work and took up Kaidanov, but the boldly printed lines and pages of the famous textbook passed before my eyes in vain. I read ten times over the words, Julius Caesar was distinguished by warlike courage. I did not understand anything and threw the book aside. Before dinner time I pomaded myself once more, and once more put on my tailcoat and necktie. What's that for? my mother demanded. You're not a student yet, 
and God knows whether you'll get through the examination. And you've not long had a new jacket. You can't throw it away. There will be visitors, I murmured almost in despair, what nonsense. Fine visitors indeed. I had to submit. I changed my tailcoat for my jacket, but I did not take off the necktie. The princess and her daughter made their appearance half an hour before dinner time the old lady had put on, in addition to the green dress with which I was already acquainted, a yellow shawl, and an old-fashioned cap adorned with flame-colored ribbons. She began talking at once about her money difficulties, sighing, complaining of her poverty, and imploring assistance, but she made herself at home. She took snuff as noisily, and fidgeted and lolled about in her chair as freely as ever. It never seemed to have struck her that she was a princess. Zenaida, on the other hand, was rigid, almost haughty in her demeanor, every inch a princess. There was a cold immobility and dignity in her face. I should not have recognized it, I should not have known her smiles, her glances, though I thought her exquisite in this new aspect too. She wore a light barege dress with pale blue flowers on it. Her hair fell in long curls down her cheek in the English fashion, this style went well with the cold expression of her face. My father sat beside her during dinner, and entertained his neighbor with the finished and serene courtesy peculiar to him. He glanced at her from time to time, and she glanced at him, but so strangely, almost with hostility. Their conversation was carried on in French. I was surprised, I remember, at the purity of Zenaida's accent. The princess, while we were at table, as before made no ceremony, she ate a great deal and praised the dishes. My mother was obviously bored by her and answered her with a sort of weary indifference. My father faintly frowned now and then. My mother did not like Zenaida either. A conceited minx, she said next day. And fancy, what she has to be conceited about, avec sa mine de grisette. It's clear you have never seen any grisettes, my father observed to her, thank God, I haven't. Thank God, to be sure, only how can you form an opinion of them, then? To me Zenaida had paid no attention whatever. Soon after dinner the princess got up to go. I shall rely on your kind offices, Maria Nikolaevna and Pyotr Vasilich, she said in a doleful sing-song to my mother and father. I've no help for it. There were days, but they are over. Here I am, an excellency, and a poor honor it is with nothing to eat. My father made her a respectful bow and escorted her to the door of the hall. I was standing there in my short jacket, staring at the floor, like a man under sentence of death. Zenaida's treatment of me had crushed me utterly. What was my astonishment when, as she passed me, she whispered quickly with her former kind expression in her eyes, Come to see us at eight, do you hear, be sure. I simply threw up my hands, but already she was gone, flinging a white scarf over her head. Chapter 7 At eight o'clock precisely, in my tailcoat and with my hair brushed up into a tuft on my head, I entered the passage of the lodge, 
where the princess lived. The old servant looked crossly at me and got up unwillingly from his bench. There was a sound of merry voices in the drawing room. I opened the door and fell back in amazement. In the middle of the room was the young princess, standing on a chair, holding a man's hat in front of her. Round the chair crowded some half a dozen men. They were trying to put their hands into the hat while she held it above their heads, shaking it violently. On seeing me, she cried, Stay, stay, another guest, he must have a ticket too. And leaping lightly down from the chair, she took me by the cuff of my coat, Come along, she said, Why are you standing still? Messers, let me make you acquainted, this is Msu Voldemar, the son of our neighbor. And this, she went on, addressing me, and indicating her guests in turn, Count Malevsky, Dr. Lushin, maiden of the poet, the retired Captain Nermatsky, and Bialovzorov the Hussar, whom you've seen already. I hope you will be good friends. I was so confused that I did not even bow to anyone. In Dr. Lushin I recognized the dark man who had so mercilessly put me to shame in the garden, the others were unknown to me. Count, continued Zenaida, write Msu Voldemar a ticket, that's not fair, was objected in a slight Polish accent by the Count, a very handsome and fashionably dressed brunette, with expressive brown eyes a thin little white nose, and delicate little mustaches over a tiny mouth. This gentleman has not been playing forfeits with us. It's unfair, repeated in chorus by Alovzorov and the gentleman described as a retired captain, a man of forty, pockmarked to a hideous degree, curly-headed as a negro, round-shouldered bandy-legged, and dressed in a military coat without epaulets, worn unbuttoned, write him a ticket, I tell you, repeated the young princess. What's this mutiny? Msu Voldemar is with us for the first time. And there are no rules for him yet. It's no use grumbling, write it, I wish it. The Count shrugged his shoulders, but bowed submissively, took the pen in his white, ring-bedecked fingers, tore off a scrap of paper, and wrote on it. At least let us explain to Mr. Voldemar what we are about, Lushin began in a sarcastic voice, or else he will be quite lost. Do you see, young man, we are playing forfeits? The princess has to pay a forfeit, and the one who draws the lucky lot is to have the privilege of kissing her hand. Do you understand what I.V.E. told you? I simply stared at him and continued to stand still in bewilderment. While the young princess jumped up on the chair again and again began waving the hat. They all stretched up to her, and I went after the rest. Maidenov, said the princess to a tall young man with a thin face, little dim-sighted eyes, and exceedingly long black hair, you as a poet ought to be magnanimous and give up your number to Msu Voldemar, so that he may have two chances instead of one. But Maidenov shook his head in refusal and tossed his hair. After all the others, I put my hand into the hat and unfolded my lot. Heavens! What was my condition when I saw on it the word, kiss, kiss? I could not help crying aloud, bravo. He has won it, the princess said quickly. How glad I am! 
she came down from the chair and gave me such a bright sweet look that my heart bounded. Are you glad, she asked me, me? I faltered, sell me your lot, Bialovzorov growled suddenly just in mire. I'll give you a hundred rubles. I answered the hussar with such an indignant look that Zinaida clapped her hands while Lushin cried, he's a fine fellow. But, as master of the ceremonies, he went on, it's my duty to see that all the rules are kept. Suvoldemar, go down on. One knee. That is our regulation, Zenaida stood in front of me, her head a little on one side as though to get a better look at me. She held out her hand to me with dignity. A mist passed before my eyes, I meant to drop on one knee, sank on both, and pressed my lips to Zenaida's fingers so awkwardly that I scratched myself a little with the tip of her nail. Well done, cried Lushin, and helped me to get up, the game of forfeits went on. Zenaida sat me down beside her. She invented all sorts of extraordinary forfeits. She had among other things to represent a statue. And she chose as a pedestal the hideous Nermatsky, told him to bow down in an arch, and bend his head down on his breast. The laughter never paused for an instant. For me, a boy constantly brought up in the seclusion of a dignified manor house. All this noise and uproar, this unceremonious, almost riotous gaiety, these relations with unknown persons, were simply intoxicating. My head went round, as though from wine. I began laughing and talking louder than the others, so much so that the old princess, who was sitting in the next room with some sort of clerk from the Tversky gate, invited by her for consultation on business, positively came in to look at me. But I felt so happy that I did not mind anything, I didn't care a straw for anyone's jeers or dubious looks. Zinaida continued to show me a preference, and kept me at her side. In one forfeit, I had to sit by her. Both hidden under one silk handkerchief, I was to tell her my secret. I remember our two heads being all at once in a warm, half-transparent, fragrant darkness, the soft, close brightness of her eyes in the dark and the burning breath from her parted lips, and the gleam of her teeth, and the ends of her hair tickling me, and setting me on fire. I was silent. She smiled slyly and mysteriously, and at last whispered to me, Well, what is it? But I merely blushed and laughed, and turned away, catching my breath. We got tired of forfeits, we began to play a game with a string. My God! What were my transports when, for not paying attention, I got a sharp and vigorous slap on my fingers from her, and how I tried afterwards to pretend that I was absent-minded, and she teased me, and would not touch the hands I held out to her. What didn't we do that evening? We played the piano, and sang and danced and acted a gypsy encampment. Nermatsky was dressed up as a bear and made to drink salt water. Count Malevsky showed us several sorts of card tricks and finished, after shuffling the cards. By dealing himself all the trumps at whist, on which Lushin had the honor of congratulating him. 
Maidanov recited portions from his poem, The Manslayer, Romanticism was at its height at this period, which he intended to bring out in a black cover with a title in blood-red letters, they stole the clerk's cap off his knee and made him dance a Cossack dance by way of ransom for it. They dressed up old Vonifidi in a woman's cap, and the young princess put on a man's hat. I could not enumerate all we did. Only Bialovzorov kept more and more in the background, scowling and angry. Sometimes his eyes looked bloodshot, he flushed all over, and it seemed every minute as though he would rush out upon us all and scatter us like shavings in all directions. But the young princess would glance at him and shake her finger at him, and he would retire into his corner again. We were quite worn out at last. Even the old princess, though she was ready for anything, as she expressed it, and no noise wearied her, felt tired at last, and longed for peace and quiet. At twelve o'clock at night, supper was served, consisting of a piece of stale dry cheese and some cold turnovers of minced ham, which seemed to me more delicious than any pastry I had ever tasted. There was only one bottle of wine, and that was a strange one, a dark-colored bottle with a wide neck, and the wine in it was of a pink hue, no one drank it, however tired out and faint with happiness. I left the lodge, at parting Zenaida pressed my hand warmly, and again smiled mysteriously. The night air was heavy and damp in my heated face, a storm seemed to be gathering, black storm clouds grew and crept across the sky, their smoky outlines visibly changing. A gust of wind shivered restlessly in the dark trees, and somewhere, far away on the horizon, muffled thunder angrily muttered as it were to itself. I made my way up to my room by the back stairs. My old man-nurse was asleep on the floor, and I had to step over him. He waked up, saw me, and told me that my mother had again been very angry with me, and had wished to send after me again, but that my father had prevented her. I had never gone to bed without saying good night to my mother and asking her blessing. There was no help for it now. I told my man that I would undress and go to bed by myself and I put out the candle. But I did not undress, and did not go to bed. I sat down on a chair, and sat a long while, as though spellbound. What I was feeling was so new and so sweet. I sat still, hardly looking round and not moving, drew slow breaths, and only from time to time laughed silently at some recollection or turned cold within at the thought that I was in love. That this was she, that this was love. Zenaida's face floated slowly before me in the darkness, floated, and did not float away. Her lips still wore the same enigmatic smile, her eyes watched me, a little from one side. With a questioning, dreamy, tender look, as at the instant of parting from her. At last I got up, walked on tiptoe to my bed, and without undressing, laid my head carefully on the pillow. As though I were afraid by an abrupt movement to disturb what filled my soul, I lay down, but did not even close my eyes. Soon I noticed that faint glimmers of light of some sort were thrown continually into the room. I sat up and looked at the window. 
the window frame could be clearly distinguished from the mysteriously and dimly lighted panes. It is a storm, I thought, and a storm it really was, but it was raging so very far away that the thunder could not be heard. Only blurred, long, as it were branching, gleams of lightning flashed continually over the sky, it was not flashing, though, so much as quivering and twitching like the wing of a dying bird. I got up, went to the window, and stood there till morning. The lightning never ceased for an instant, it was what is called among the peasants a sparrow night. I gazed at the dumb sandy plain, at the dark mass of the Neskochny gardens, at the yellowish facades of the distant buildings, which seemed to quiver too at each faint flash. I gazed and could not turn away these silent lightning flashes. These gleams seemed in response to the secret silent fires which were aglow within me. Morning began to dawn. The sky was flushed in patches of crimson. As the sun came nearer, the lightning grew gradually paler and ceased. The quivering gleams were fewer and fewer, and vanished at last, drowned in the sobering positive light of the coming day. And my lightning flashes vanished too. I felt great weariness and peace, but Zenaida's image still floated triumphant over my soul. But it too, this image, seemed more tranquil, like a swan rising out of the reeds of a bog. It stood out from the other unbeautiful figures surrounding it, and as I fell asleep, I flung myself before it in farewell, trusting adoration. Oh, sweet emotions, gentle harmony, goodness and peace of the softened heart! Melting bliss of the first raptures of love, where are they, where are they? Chapter 8 The next morning, when I came down to tea, my mother scolded me, less severely, however, than I had expected, and made me tell her how I had spent the previous evening. I answered her in few words, omitting many details, and trying to give the most innocent air to everything, anyway. They're people who are not Camille Fout, my mother commented, and you've no business to be hanging about there. Instead of preparing yourself for the examination and doing your work. As I was well aware that my mother's anxiety about my studies was confined to these few words. I did not feel it necessary to make any rejoinder. But after morning tea was over, my father took me by the arm, and turning into the garden with me, forced me to tell him all I had seen at the Zosiacans. A curious influence my father had over me, and curious were the relations existing between us. He took hardly any interest in my education, but he never hurt my feelings. He respected my freedom, he treated me, if I may so express it, with courtesy, only he never let me be really close to him. I loved him, I admired him, he was my ideal of a man, and heavens. How passionately devoted I should have been to him, if I had not been continually conscious of his holding me off. But when he liked, he could almost instantaneously, by a single word, a single gesture, call forth an unbounded confidence in him. My soul expanded, I chattered away to him, as to a wise friend, a kindly teacher, then he as suddenly got rid of me, and again he was keeping me off, gently and affectionately, but still he kept me off. 
Sometimes he was in high spirits, and then he was ready to romp and frolic with me like a boy. He was fond of vigorous physical exercise of every sort once. It never happened a second time. He caressed me with such tenderness that I almost shed tears. But high spirits and tenderness alike vanished completely, and what had passed between us gave me nothing to build on for the future. It was as though I had dreamed it all. Sometimes I would scrutinize his clever, handsome, bright face, my heart would throb, and my whole being yearned to him. He would seem to feel what was going on within me, would give me a passing pat on the cheek, and go away, or take up some work, or suddenly freeze all over as only he knew how to freeze, and I shrank into myself at once, and turned cold too. His rare fits of friendliness to me were never called forth by my silent. But intelligible entreaties, they always occurred unexpectedly. Thinking over my father's character later, I have come to the conclusion that he had no thoughts to spare for me and for family life. His heart was in other things, and found complete satisfaction elsewhere. Take for yourself what you can, and don't be ruled by others, to belong to oneself, the whole savor of life lies in that, he said to me one day. Another time, I, as a young Democrat, fell to airing my views on liberty, he was kind, as I used to call it, that day, and at such times I could talk to him as I liked. Liberty, he repeated, and do you know what can give a man liberty? What? Will, his own will, and it gives power, which is better than liberty. Know how to will, and you will be free, and will lead. My father, before all, and above all, desired to live, and lived. Perhaps he had a presentiment that he would not have longed to enjoy the savor of life. He died at forty-two. I described my evening at the Zosiakins minutely to my father. Half attentively, half carelessly, he listened to me, sitting on a garden seat, drawing in the sand with his cane. Now and then he laughed, shot bright, droll glances at me, and spurred me on with short questions and assents. At first I could not bring myself even to utter the name of Zenaida, but I could not restrain myself long, and began singing her praises. My father still laughed. Then he grew thoughtful, stretched, and got up. I remembered that as he came out of the house he had ordered his horse to be saddled. He was a splendid horseman, and, long before Rory, had the secret of breaking in the most vicious horses. Shall I come with you, father? I asked. No, he answered, and his face resumed its ordinary expression of friendly indifference. Go alone, if you like, and tell the coachman I'm not going. He turned his back on me and walked rapidly away. I looked after him, he disappeared through the gates. I saw his hat moving along beside the fence, he went into the Zosiakins. He stayed there not more than an hour, but then departed at once for the town and did not return home till evening. After dinner I went myself to the Zosiakins. In the drawing-room I found only the old princess. On seeing me she scratched her head under her cap with a knitting needle and suddenly asked me could I copy a petition for her. 
with pleasure, I replied, sitting down on the edge of a chair, only mind and make the letters bigger, observed the princess, handing me a dirty sheet of paper, and couldn't you do it today, my good sir? Certainly, I will copy it today. The door of the next room was just opened, and in the crack I saw the face of Zenaida, pale and pensive, her hair flung carelessly back, she stared at me with big chilly eyes, and softly closed the door. Zena, Zena, called the old lady. Zenaida made no response. I took home the old lady's petition and spent the whole evening over it. Chapter 9 My passion dated from that day. I felt at that time, I recollect, something like what a man must feel on entering the service. I had ceased now to be simply a young boy, I was in love. I have said that my passion dated from that day. I might have added that my sufferings too dated from the same day. Away from Zenaida I pined, nothing was to my mind, everything went wrong with me, I spent whole days thinking intensely about her. I pined when away, but in her presence I was no better off. I was jealous, I was conscious of my insignificance, I was stupidly sulky or stupidly abject, and, all the same, an invincible force drew me to her. And I could not help a shudder of delight whenever I stepped through the doorway of her room. Zenaida guessed at once that I was in love with her, and indeed I never even thought of concealing it. She amused herself with my passion, made a fool of me, petted and tormented me. There is a sweetness in being the sole source, the autocratic and irresponsible cause of the greatest joy and profoundest pain to another. And I was like wax in Zenaida's hands, though, indeed, I was not the only one in love with her. All the men who visited the house were crazy over her, and she kept them all in leading strings at her feet. It amused her to arouse their hopes and then their fears, to turn them round her finger, she used to call it knocking their heads together, while they never dreamed of offering resistance and eagerly submitted to her. About her whole being, so full of life and beauty, there was a peculiarly bewitching mixture of slyness and carelessness, of artificiality and simplicity, of composure and frolicsomeness, about everything she did or said. About every action of hers there clung a delicate, fine charm, in which an individual power was manifest at work. And her face was ever-changing, working too, it expressed, almost at the same time, irony, dreaminess, and passion. Various emotions, delicate and quick-changing as the shadows of clouds on a sunny day of wind, chased one another continually over her lips and eyes. Each of her adorers was necessary to her. Bialovzorov, whom she sometimes called my wild beast, and sometimes simply mine, would gladly have flung himself into the fire for her sake. With little confidence in his intellectual abilities and other qualities, he was forever offering her marriage, hinting that the others were merely hanging about with no serious intention. Maidenov responded to the poetic fibers of her nature, a man of rather cold temperament. Like almost all writers, he forced himself to convince her, and perhaps himself, that he adored her, sang her praises in endless verses, 
and read them to her with a peculiar enthusiasm at once affected and sincere. She sympathized with him, and at the same time jeered at him a little, she had no great faith in him, and after listening to his outpourings, she would make him red Pushkin, as she said, to clear the air. Lushin, the ironical doctor, so cynical in words, knew her better than any of them, and loved her more than all, though he abused her to her face and behind her back. She could not help respecting him, but made him smart for it, and at times, with a peculiar, malignant pleasure, made him feel that he too was at her mercy. I'm a flirt, I'm heartless, I'm an actress in my instincts, she said to him one day in my presence, well and good. Give me your hand then. I'll stick this pin in it, you'll be ashamed of this young man seeing it, it will hurt you, but you'll laugh for all that, you truthful person. Lushin crimsoned, turned away, bit his lips, but ended by submitting his hand. She pricked it, and he did in fact begin to laugh, and she laughed, thrusting the pin in pretty deeply, and peeping into his eyes, which he vainly strove to keep in other directions. I understood least of all the relations existing between Zenaida and Count Malevsky. He was handsome, clever, and adroit, but something equivocal, something false in him was apparent even to me, a boy of sixteen. And I marveled that Zenaida did not notice it. But possibly she did notice this element of falsity really and was not repelled by it. Her irregular education, strange acquaintances and habits, the constant presence of her mother. The poverty and disorder in their house, everything, from the very liberty the young girl enjoyed, with the consciousness of her superiority to the people around her, had developed in her a sort of half-contemptuous carelessness and lack of fastidiousness. At any time anything might happen, Vonifati might announce that there was no sugar, or some revolting scandal would come to her ears, or her guests would fall to quarreling among themselves, she would only shake her curls, and say, what does it matter, and care little enough about it, but my blood anyway, was sometimes on fire with indignation when Malevsky approached her with a sly, fox-like action leaned gracefully on the back of her chair, and began whispering in her ear with a self-satisfied and ingratiating little smile while she folded her arms across her bosom, looked intently at him and smiled too, and shook her head. What induces you to receive Count Malevsky? I asked her one day dot he has such pretty mustaches, she answered. But that's rather beyond you. You needn't think I care for him, she said to me another time. No, I can't care for people I have to look down upon. I must have someone who can master me. But, merciful heavens, I hope I may never come across anyone like that. I don't want to be caught in anyone's claws, not for anything, you'll never be in love, then? And you? Don't I love you, she said, and she flicked me on the nose with the tip of her glove. Yes, Zenaida amused herself hugely at my expense. For three weeks I saw her every day, and what didn't she do with me? She rarely came to see us, and I was not sorry for it. In our house she was transformed into a young lady. 
a young princess, and I was a little overawed by her. I was afraid of betraying myself before my mother, she had taken a great dislike to Zenaida, and kept a hostile eye upon us. My father I was not so much afraid of, he seemed not to notice me. He talked little to her, but always with special cleverness and significance. I gave up working and reading, I even gave up walking about the neighborhood and riding my horse. Like a beetle tied by the leg. I moved continually round and round my beloved little lodge. I would gladly have stopped there altogether, it seemed, but that was impossible. My mother scolded me, and sometimes Zenaida herself drove me away. Then I used to shut myself up in my room, or go down to the very end of the garden, and climbing into what was left of a tall stone greenhouse, now in ruins. Sit for hours with my legs hanging over the wall that looked on to the road, gazing and gazing and seeing nothing. White butterflies flitted lazily by me. Over the dusty nettles, a saucy sparrow settled not far off on the half-crumbling red brickwork and twittered irritably, incessantly twisting and turning and preening his tail feathers, the still mistrustful rooks cawed now and then. Sitting high, high up on the bare top of a birch tree, the sun and wind played softly on its pliant branches. The tinkle of the bells of the Dawn Monastery floated across to me from time to time, peaceful and dreary, while I sat, gazed, listened, and was filled full of a nameless sensation in which all was contained, sadness and joy and the foretaste of the future, and the desire and dread of life. But at that time I understood nothing of it and could have given a name to nothing of all that was passing at random within me, or should have called it all by one name, the name of Zenaida. Zenaida continued to play cat and mouse with me. She flirted with me, and I was all agitation and rapture, then she would suddenly thrust me away, and I dared not go near her, dared not look at her. I remember she was very cold to me for several days together, I was completely crushed, and creeping timidly to their lodge, tried to keep close to the old princess, regardless of the circumstance that. She was particularly scolding and grumbling just at that time, her financial affairs had been going badly, and she had already had two explanations with the police officials. One day I was walking in the garden beside the familiar fence, and I caught sight of Zenaida, leaning on both arms. She was sitting on the grass, not stirring a muscle. I was about to make off cautiously. But she suddenly raised her head and beckoned me imperiously. My heart failed me, I did not understand her at first. She repeated her signal. I promptly jumped over the fence and ran joyfully up to her. But she brought me to a halt with a look and motioned me to the path two paces from her. In confusion, not knowing what to do, I fell on my knees at the edge of the path. She was so pale, such bitter suffering. Such intense weariness was expressed in every feature of her face that it sent a pang to my heart, and I muttered on. Consciously, what is the matter? Zenaida stretched out her head, picked a blade of grass, bit it and flung it away from her. You love me very much, she asked at last. Yes. 
I made no answer, indeed, what need was there to answer, yes, she repeated, looking at me as before. That's so. The same eyes, she went on, sank into thought, and hid her face in her hands. Everything's grown so loathsome to me, she whispered, I would have gone to the other end of the world first, I can't bear it, I can't get over it. And what is there before me? Ah, I am wretched. My God, how wretched I am. What for? I asked timidly, Zenaida made no answer, she simply shrugged her shoulders. I remained kneeling, gazing at her with intense sadness. Every word she had uttered simply cut me to the heart. At that instant I felt I would gladly have given my life, if only she should not grieve. I gazed at her, and though I could not understand why she was wretched, I vividly pictured to myself how in a fit of insupportable anguish. She had suddenly come out into the garden and sunk to the earth, as though mown down by a scythe. It was all bright and green about her, the wind was whispering in the leaves of the trees. And swinging now and then a long branch of a raspberry bush over Zenaida's head, there was a sound of the cooing of doves, and the bees hummed, flying low over the scanty grass. Overhead the sun was radiantly blue, while I was so sorrowful. Read me some poetry, said Zenaida in an undertone, and she propped herself on her elbow, I like your reading poetry. You read it in sing-song, but that's no matter, that comes of being young. Read me on the hills of Georgia. Only sit down first, I sat down and read on the hills of Georgia. That the heart cannot choose but love, repeated Zenaida. That's where poetry's so fine, it tells us what is not, and what's not only better than what is, but much more like the truth cannot choose but love? It might want not to, but it can't help it. She was silent again, then all at once she started and got up. Come along. Maidenov's indoors with Mama, he brought me his poem, but I deserted him.